What is the story of God? Is it that book we know as the Bible? Is it the stories we are told in our Sunday school classes? The answer is yes, but there's more to it. Although the stories in the Bible took place a long time ago, we still learn from them today. The Bible is done being written, but guess what? The story of God is far from over, and God invites each of us to be a part of it. Within those 66 books, there's creation, fall, chosen people, kingdom of God, mission, and new creation. There's a single grand narrative throughout the story of God, that God loves us and longs to be in a relationship with each and every one of us. We each have an important role to play within the story of God. Let's discover how we get to be a part of the story of God when we say yes to following Jesus. Hey, my name is Bill. I'm a pastor here at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. I serve as our location pastor at our West location, uh, which is in Olathe, and it is great to be here with you today. We're going to talk about the church and the history of the church, but first, let's read some scripture. Our scripture today is uh, in the book of Acts, which is like the fifth book of the New Testament. It's the second chapter, starting at verse 42. I'm going to read out of the CEB version if you want to read along with me. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They share food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. Well, this is a picture of the church that we see at the very uh, earliest part of our story, uh, of our story as a Christian people. This is Acts 2, and in some ways, this is the birthplace of the church. This is what we call the story of the day of Pentecost. It's the moment that we believe that the church begins to unleash upon the world this manifest, beautiful idea of grace and hope and community and peace. And I love that picture. The people are daily joining in this group that is, is selling everything they have, giving everything they have to do all the good they can in every way they can. Now that picture of the church looks a little bit different than what we experience, doesn't it? I, I don't know about you, but my experience in church looks a lot different. You know, typically on a Sunday morning, uh, we don't always eat a meal together. Sometimes we'll eat communion, sometimes there are snacks, but often we sing and we pray and we read scripture and, and there's a sermon. It's a little bit of a different picture, but it's the same mission. So let's talk about how we got from this picture in Acts 2 to where you and I experience today. So that's Acts 2. And right after that moment, there's this sending forth of some of Jesus' earliest disciples and, and some of his earliest followers, and they go forth all over the earth, or at least as far as they think the earth goes. Uh, we think some of the disciples, probably Thomas and a few others, end up in India. Others end up far to the west. Um, remember, they're leaving from Jerusalem, and some will end up in the west. Uh, the Apostle Paul, for instance, will end up in, in Rome. He's trying to get to Spain, which to him is the end of the known world. And so Christianity in the first couple generations, right after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, begins to spread. And as it spreads, it begins to look a little different in every location. Sometimes uh, they sing different songs or speak different languages. Sometimes they serve in different ways, but they all have this same shared love for one another. Now, sometimes those differences that they have cause them to split apart. And so at times the, the church will go in different ways. At times the church will try to come together again and say, what do we agree on? And what are the things that are essential to us? And they have these things called ecumenical councils. There's a lot of them where they come together and they say, here's the things that we all say you've got to believe on to be a Christian. Sometimes out of that will come a creed like the Apostles' Creed. And, and maybe you'll learn about that or, or have a chance to discuss that. Um, sometimes they, they agree on a list of scripture and what are the things that we all agree are, are parts of the Bible. And it, through this, God continues to work through this group of people, holding them together in community as they carry forth in their own local places, whether that's in uh, eastern India, in South Asia, or western Spain, in the west coast of Europe, all of these places where they're experiencing a community of love and care. Now, at times, they couldn't all get along. And so we see that there's, uh, there's places where, where times the church kind of breaks apart a little bit. In 1054, there's what we call the Great Schism. And basically the Western Church and the Eastern Church decide they can't really get along on everything anymore. 
Um, in the 1500s, there's what we call the Protestant Reformation. And Martin Luther nails 95 theses to the door of a cathedral and says, these are the problems I have with the church. And, and the church divides into Protestant and Catholic, at least in, in Europe. At times, uh, own and unique little manifestations of Christianity pop up. And ours started like that. See, I'm part of the United Methodist Church, and we come out of a time uh, about the same time as the birth of the United States. And there was a guy named John Wesley. Now, John Wesley's dad was a, a preacher, and, uh, and John Wesley was a, just a brilliant guy. By the time he's in his mid-20s, he's already a professor at Oxford Seminary. I mean, just an incredibly intelligent guy. And yet something was still missing. He knew all the answers. He'd grown up in church. He, he knew the theology. He could have taught the theology, and he didn't feel it inside. And so John Wesley goes seeking and, and searching. At one point, his story takes him to, uh, at that time, the newly discovered, or at least to his people, the newly discovered continent of North America. And, uh, and John Wesley unsuccessfully tries to be a missionary there. It doesn't really work out too well. And he goes back to England, and, and he's just heartbroken, thinking that this isn't going to work for him, and that, that something must be missing. He knows the answers in his head. He doesn't feel them in his heart. And now he begins to feel dejected. And then John Wesley has this experience that we call the Aldersgate experience. And he's at a friend's house by his own admission. He says, I went very unwillingly to a Bible study. And, uh, and it's there as one of his friends is reading uh, Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans that John Wesley says, my heart was strangely warmed and I began to feel that salvation was for me, even me. And John Wesley goes, there's something powerful here. It's not just a matter of intellect. It's a matter of the heart. And, and he begins to gather some friends together and they say, we want to pursue this. We want to get closer to God. He's so excited and, and he's fired up. He, he gets his friends together and they start this thing that, well, at first others call Methodism as an insult. <laughs> the title of our denomination wasn't intentionally meant to be nice. It wasn't good branding at the beginning. People said, you think you have a method for how you can get closer to God? They said, yeah, we do. And we call it Church. It's how we as a people get closer to the holiness that God has called to us. And so they would get together and they would read scripture together so they could know more about God. They would sing together, even writing these beautiful worship hymns so that they could feel more of God's presence. They would serve together and carry forth God's mission into the world. This was the early Methodist church and, and it's developing right as the United States is developing. So in, in world history, that's kind of the frame of reference. But not only that, John Wesley says, hey, this is great for those of us who are part of it but it's also supposed to be good news for those who aren't part of the church yet. And so he would go to places where, where nobody, well, they'd heard of Jesus, but nobody felt it. And like John Wesley, they might know the answers, but they hadn't felt their hearts warmed. So he would go to coal mines where people worked six, seven days a week, 12 and 14 hour days. And they didn't get a break. They didn't really have anything protecting them. And he would go in and he would talk to these big burly coal miners and he would say, hey, I've got a message for you. And, and then at that point, the coal mine would typically shut down because this was, I mean, John Wesley was a celebrity by this point. And there are stories of coal miners standing out front of their coal mine, big burly tough guys, hearing John Wesley say, hey, the message of grace, the love of Jesus, it's not just for other people, it's for you. And stories of tears rolling down their coal stained faces as these big, tough, burly men hear for the first time in their life that they are loved. He would do the same thing in lumber mills. He would do the same thing in industrial foundries all across the world, or at least across his world, helping people understand that the knowledge that they'd heard about in scripture and whispered about in Sunday school as a child was actually love meant for them. And the Methodist church began to grow like wildfire. It spread across England where he was at the time. It spread across North America. There were these people called circuit writers they were people who said, I'm all in on Jesus and, I, and I'm called to be a pastor. And they were sent uh, not just to established churches, but instead to established churches. They were sent uh, to a whole area. You might have a circuit writer who was sent to what we might now call Ohio. Just with a simple marching order, hey, there's people out there. Go find a puff of smoke on the horizon and let them know about the love of Jesus. And so these circuit riders would travel from town to town to town, building churches wherever they could find a building big enough, a schoolhouse or a bar room or just the biggest open field they could find where people could hear that they were loved by God. And that's a little bit about who we are as a church. We're a community of people who are sent on a mission. We find its roots back in Acts 2. We find its roots back in Matthew 16. We find its roots written throughout our scriptures and lived out throughout our tradition and our history to carry forth a message that all are welcoming, that God's kingdom is open wide, and that all are invited to carry that message forth. 
So John Wesley said it's really important, not just that you know these uh, things intellectually, but that you experience them. He had what he called um, experiences of grace, tangible expressions of God's grace. We call them sacraments. And for John Wesley, there were two that were, uh, that were chief. There was baptism, where we are initiated, we enter into, we become part of the community of God and the family of God. And there was communion, where we gather together, we remember Christ's sacrifice and, and also Christ's new life offered to us through the bread and the cup, the body and the blood. These were things that he would say every single, every single time you're together, you should take communion and, and, and you should be baptized as quick as possible, baptizing children because we're all welcome into the community of God. These were the sacraments. And John Wesley said, hey, we, we've got a lot of times that we've had, you know, we've seen the church kind of break apart and we don't want to do that again. We don't think that we're any better than anybody else. You know, as, as Methodists, we think that we have a, a story to tell and it's something important to say. We're not trying to, to dog on anybody else. This is just who we are. Um, but here's how we're going to struggle through these questions. Um, when we have times that we disagree with somebody else, we're going to lead on four things. And he called them the quadrilateral. We're going to lean on scripture. That's the Old and New Testaments. Tradition. That's the experience of the church before us. Our own experience. What have we felt? Where have we seen God guiding us? Where have we felt that nudge of the Holy Spirit like John Wesley did? And the fourth would be reason. What does our mind tell us? We're not supposed to leave our mind at the door. But through those sacraments and through that quadrilateral, we became the United Methodist Church through the leading of, of these circuit writers who began to push the church into places where no one had ever heard. And that carries the torch onto us. And friends, I've seen the church in a lot of different ways. I've seen this church lead in beautiful and powerful ways. One of my favorites is on Candlelight Christmas Eve as I see people lifting candles and see the angelic faces of all of us gathering to sing and to worship. I've seen it in dirtier places, at the, the floods after uh, Hurricane Katrina. And um, I lived a couple of years ago in a town that got flooded out. And I watched as the church rallied and people got together. And, and then I'd see person after person say, hey, I'm here from this church or that church. And we all gathered together to rebuild towns. I've seen the church at its best when times are at its worst. And people show up and say, we're here and we love you before we even know you existed because that's who God calls us to be. Friends, that's who we are as a church. We're gonna talk about that in our groups, but may we live it out in our lives.